We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. There, there she is, NASA's Voyager 1, launched in 1977. But uh, that, that's just uh, very small potatoes compared to uh, what the Earth is involved with and knows about. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Good day, uh, my dear netizens, ladies and gentlemen. So, for today, we will be tackling the tools of the astronomer. And uh, one of the important tools of the modern astronomer is the telescope. Okay, the telescope is like an extension of the human eye. Okay, the human eye has its limitations. So, the human eye cannot uh, observe or perceive very small objects. So, that's why we need to extend our vision. Uh, we need an instrument like the microscope so that we can observe very small objects. And the human eye also cannot perceive very far or distant objects. So, we need an extension of our eye. So, we need the telescope. Okay? 
And who invented the telescope? Now, it was not Galileo. Okay, many of you might think that it was uh, Galileo who invented the telescope. The telescope was invented by Hans Lippershey. Okay, he's a Dutch lens maker, Hans Lippershey. Alright, so this was uh, his telescope. So his telescope uh, was made of uh, two lenses, okay, placed at opposite ends of this tube. Alright, so that was the uh, first telescope that Hans Lippershey uh, had made. Okay, then Galileo uh, got heard of uh, this uh, instrument made by Hans Lippershey. So he made one for himself. Okay, and uh, that was the telescope made by Galileo. Uh, it's similar to Hans Lippershey, but... Uh, his telescope was far more powerful than Hans Lippershey. Okay, his telescope can magnify up to 30 times. And what's good about uh, his telescope is that Galileo pointed his telescope towards the night sky. Okay? And uh, with his telescope, he discovered uh, the four largest moons of Jupiter, which we now call as the Galilean moons. Uh, Galileo also observed the uh, craters of the moon. You know, before, uh, the people thought that the moon was just a uh, smooth uh, white uh, ball, crystal ball. But when Galileo pointed his telescope towards the moon, Galileo saw craters, Galileo saw plains and mountains. Okay? And Galileo also observed Venus. And uh, he noticed through his telescope that Venus changes shape or faces, much like our moon. Okay? And uh, with this observation, it supported the uh, Copernican model of the solar system. Okay? Alright, now everybody turn to the uh, diagram. So this was the uh, telescope that Galileo had assembled. So it's composed of a uh, double convex lens. That's the uh, objective lens of his telescope. And the eyepiece was a double concave lens. Alright, so this is the uh, Galilean telescope that uh, he assembled. Alright, advantages. Uh, the final image is erect or upright and it is useful for terrestrial observations. Alright, uh, one disadvantage of the Galilean telescope is that it has a small field of view. Uh, later, we shall discuss what field of view is. Alright, okay, so this was the uh, Galilean telescope that... Uh, Galileo Galilei assembled. Alright, and uh, turn to this uh, diagram. Johannes Kepler also designed a telescope. Uh, his telescope was composed of a double convex lens as the objective lens. And look at the eyepiece. The eyepiece is also a double convex lens. Unlike that of Galileo's telescope. Okay, the advantage of the uh, Keplerian telescope is that it has a wider field of view. Alright? Okay, so what are the different types of telescopes? Okay, first we have what we call a refracting telescope. Okay? A refracting telescope is a telescope that uses lenses okay, to bend or to refract light. Okay, so like the one made by Galileo and Hans Lippershey, okay, the Galilean telescope and even the telescope assembled by Johannes Kepler, they're all refracting telescope that uses lenses to produce a magnified image of the distant object. Okay, so my dear netizens, here is the uh, basic design of a refracting telescope okay this is similar to the keplerian uh, design so we have here the objective lens the objective lens is a double 
convex lens that uh, collects incoming light. Okay, and um, the objective lens produces an initial uh, magnified image. Then the initial magnified image is further enlarged by the eyepiece, the eyepiece lens. The eyepiece lens is also a double convex lens. Okay, so that's the basic design of the refracting telescope. Alright, so here is a modern uh, refracting telescope used by many amateur astronomers, including me. Yan, so I think ginagamit ko din. Meron akong ganyan na uh, refracting telescope. Okay, so this type of telescope is uh, a refracting telescope. So, a refracting telescope uses lenses to produce a magnified image of the distant object. So, there are two major lenses here. We have here the objective lens. Okay, the objective lens collects the light from the distant object. And at the opposite end of the telescope tube is the eyepiece lens. Okay, so this telescope is similar to the one made by Hans Lippershey, by Galileo, and by Johannes Kepler. So, and this telescope is mounted on an altazimuth mount or altazimuthal mount. So in this type of mount, there are two movements. So we have the left and right movement, like so, and the up and down movement. So, this type of mount is called an altazimuth or altazimuthal mount. Okay, so, advantages of this telescope. Yeah, this telescope is rigid, sturdy. Uh, you don't need to uh, align the lenses. And, um, it's quite good. The only disadvantage of this type of telescope is that this telescope uh, produces color fringes or the refracting telescope suffers from what we call chromatic aberration. But uh, again, um, modern refracting telescopes now have correcting lenses that eliminates chromatic aberration or minimizes chromatic aberration. Alright, so again we have here the uh, finder scope. So this finder scope allows you to locate your target. Okay, so this is a... Uh, refracting telescope okay so the largest refracting telescope is in the united states it's in the yerkes observatory okay the yerkes observatory was built in the late 1890s in wisconsin it houses the world's largest refracting telescope okay the uh, 77 uh, acre facility in Williams Bay, Wisconsin that houses the 40 inch okay, that's 100 centimeter telescope which is the largest refracting telescope ever built and hanggang ngayon hindi pa yan na, ano, na higitan that's still the largest refracting telescope it is the Yerkes telescope at Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin okay, here's the Yerkes Observatory and inside is the Yerkes Telescope. So my dear netizens, this is the largest refracting telescope in the world. It has a 40-inch uh, objective lens. Okay? Ayan, malaki yan. See? Fantastic. Okay, so that's the Yerkes Telescope. That's the largest refracting telescope. Okay. Now, disadvantages of the refracting telescope, the uh, refracting telescope suffers from chromatic aberration. Okay? So, when you say chromatic aberration, um, the lenses produces some color fringes. Okay? Uh, something like this. So, when you look at the uh, distant object, you will see some blue, green, or red color fringes in the final image and that's not good okay hindi magandang tignan yung final image with all of these color fringes so many refracting telescopes suffer from chromatic aberration 
But there are modern refracting telescopes that can correct such uh, defect okay, by using uh, additional lenses to minimize chromatic aberration. Okay, ayan. So, when you look at the image, there are color fringes. Mga red, blue, ayan, color fringes. Okay, this is Mars. And look at the image of Mars. Medyo hindi maganda. There are color fringes. So, the invention of achromatic lenses uh, correct this uh, defect. Okay, achromatic lenses uh, corrects chromatic aberration. Yan. Okay? So, additional lenses are uh, installed to minimize these color fringes. Okay? Uh, the second type of telescope is called the reflecting telescope. The reflecting telescope uses mirrors. Okay? Uh, the reflecting telescope reflects light of a concave mirror. Okay? That uh, focuses the image and eventually produces the uh, desired magnified image of the distant object. Okay, the reflecting telescope was uh, designed by Isaac Newton, and this was the first reflecting telescope designed by Isaac Newton. Okay, hi, so this is Astronomy at Home, and I will be explaining how this thing works. So this is what we call a reflecting telescope. Okay, by the name itself, reflecting, this telescope uses mirrors to capture the light of a distant object. Uh, this telescope was designed by no other than Sir Isaac Newton himself. Okay, so inside the telescope tube is a concave mirror. So as you can see here, alright, so inside there is a concave mirror that collects the light let's say of a distant object, say the moon or a star or a planet, then the collected light is bounced off a, a secondary mirror. There's a secondary mirror near the top of the, the telescope tube and it is reflected onto this eyepiece. So if you look at the eyepiece, uh, the image is magnified. Okay, what we have here also is a finder scope that... Uh, allows you to locate your target. Uh, the telescope is mounted in an equatorial mount. So, uh, the equatorial mount is polar aligned, meaning that it's, it is pointing at the North Star. But anyway, uh, I will explain further the, the use of the equatorial mount. Advantages of this reflecting telescope, well, it eliminates color fringes or chromatic aberration and it is cheaper than the refracting telescope which i will explain later okay okay let me give you now a guided tour of the basic parts of this telescope so this is the uh, telescope tube All right uh, this telescope is a reflecting telescope Reflecting because this telescope uses mirrors to produce a magnified image. So inside the telescope tube is the primary mirror. You can see the primary mirror below the telescope tube. The primary mirror is a concave or spherical mirror. See that? And near the top of the telescope tube is a secondary flat mirror there so the primary mirror collects the light from the distant object uh, and it brings it into a focal point then the flat mirror reflects the uh, initial image onto this eyepiece okay that's your eyepiece uh, this design was uh, made by Isaac Newton. So this is what we call a Newtonian reflecting telescope. Alright, so we have here the focusing knob. And we have here the uh, finder scope. The finder scope allows you to locate your target object. 
Okay, then below here we have two knobs. This is the declination knob. And this knob right here is the right ascension knob. Then we have here the counterweights. So it allows you to balance your telescope. And we have here the mount and tripod. The mount is called an equatorial mount. Anyway, we will uh, explain later how the equatorial mount works. Okay, so those are the basic parts of this telescope, reflecting telescope. Okay, so that's your reflecting telescope. Now, one advantage of the reflecting telescope is that it eliminates chromatic aberration. Okay, or those color fringes that I mentioned a while ago. So, a reflecting telescope gives you a much clearer and sharper image as compared to a refractor. Uh, but again, the refractor also has its advantages and disadvantages. Alright? Okay. Now, the largest reflecting telescope uh, is located in Spain. Now, as of 2013, the largest reflecting telescope in the world is the Grand Telescopio Canarias, which is located in Las Palmas, Spain. The uh, objective mirror okay, has a diameter of about 34.2 feet. Ang laki! Okay, or 10.4 meters. That's the uh, objective mirror, the concave mirror. Okay? Uh, the diameter is 34.2 feet. So, ang laki niyan. So, this is the uh, observatory that houses the uh, largest reflecting telescope in the world. The Gran Telescopio Canarias. Okay? And that's the uh, largest reflecting telescope in the world. Ayan. So, that's the uh, primary mirror or the objective mirror. Uh, which has a diameter of about uh, 10 meters. Okay, 10.4 meters. Ang laki, di ba? Laki. Lang telescope na ito. Alright, so that's the Grand Telescopio Canarias. Also, um, in Hawaii, uh, there is also the Keck Telescope. Malaki rin ito. The Keck Telescope. So, here's the uh, Keck Telescope. Ayan. I look at the primary mirror or the objective mirror. So, it's similar to the Grand Telescopio Canaris. Kaya lang mas malaki yun sa Spain. Okay. Uh, look at the size of the primary mirror. Okay. May mga segments. Diba? Okay. And this is the Hale Telescope. And so, the uh, primary mirror has a diameter of about 200 inches. Yeah, a 200-inch mirror. Okay, so that's the uh, Hale Telescope. Here in the Philippines, uh, we have the Pag-asa Astronomical Observatory in UP Diliman. Okay, in fact, that's the largest uh, reflecting telescope here in the Philippines. It is located at the Pag-asa Astronomical Observatory. Okay, so that's the reflecting telescope. Uh, here is the reflecting telescope at UP Nismed. Ito na, nagamit ko to once. Okay, pero ang madalas gumamit nito is si Sir Edmond Rosales. Yeah, that's him, the photo. Okay, this is the second largest reflecting telescope in the Philippines. The largest is at Pag-asa. Ang difference lang nila, tignan mga centimeters lang. Okay? okay? This type of telescope is what we call a catadioptric telescope. Okay, catadioptric, that means that it is a combination of both refractive and reflective elements. Now, in front of the telescope is a correcting lens. This correcting lens uh, minimizes or corrects any color fringes or chromatic aberration. 
Then at the back of the telescope is the primary mirror. Then there's a secondary flat mirror. So it's similar to the Newtonian telescope. But the only difference is that in front of this telescope is a correcting lens. So it is a combination of both refractive and reflective uh, elements. So we call this a catadioptric uh, telescope. First, we will look at the three major types of amateur telescopes. Refractors, reflectors, and compound or catadioptric telescopes. When most people think telescope, they probably imagine a refractor like this one. They have a large glass lens at one end through which light passes and refracts or bends the light to a focal point. As the light passes the focal point here, we place an eyepiece, which then focuses the light into a magnified image we can see. Though usually a star diagonal is placed here to bounce the light 90 degrees for more comfortable viewing. So far so good, right? A reflector, on the other hand, is often called a Newtonian telescope. These can be mounted on equatorial or Dobsonian mounts. And yes, this type of telescope was named after Isaac Newton, who first came up with this telescope concept. As the name implies, light is reflected off of a mirror in this kind of telescope, usually placed at the bottom of a tube. As it is reflected, it is towards a focal point as well, but note where that happens, near the top of the tube. That makes it hard to place an eyepiece there as both the focuser and your head would block incoming light. So a reflector uses a secondary mirror, a small, diagonally shaped flat mirror to bounce the light out of the side of the tube like this, where it enters the focuser and reaches the eyepiece. The third type of telescope is a compound telescope or catadioptric. Cata what? I know, that's a big word. It means an optical system that involves both the reflecting and refracting of light in order to reduce aberration. So this schmidt cassegrain telescope, for example, utilizes a corrector lens on the front of the telescope, a strongly curved primary mirror at the back, and then another outwardly curved mirror in the middle of the corrector lens before light finally goes through the center of the back of the telescope to the eyepiece. It basically can take a very long focal length light path and fold it into a shorter tube. There are other versions of catadioptric scopes, Schmidt Cassegrains and Maxitov Cassegrains being the most prominent amateur types available. Let's take a quick overview of the strengths and weaknesses of each. For refractors, here are some advantages. Unobstructed design and ease of manufacture allows for theoretically better optical quality. Eyepiece location is convenient in smaller models. They tend to be portable in apertures of 100 millimeters or less and are easy to aim. Some disadvantages include chromatic aberration in acromats, where not all wavelengths of light focus in the same place. Apochromatic designs, though overcoming chromatic aberration, are usually three to five times as expensive. In longer focal lengths, the long tubes can sway in the wind or on inexpensive mounts, and larger models place eyepieces uncomfortably low. Reflectors have their own set of advantages, no chromatic aberration, easier and less expensive to make in larger apertures, faster focal ratio systems provide wide fields of view, light grasp in larger models is excellent, and the cost per inch of aperture is best. But they also have their drawbacks. The optical aberration coma occurs in faster models unless specialized eyepieces or correctors are used. Light loss due to multiple mirrors is greater than refractors. Central obstruction due to secondary mirror can cause diffraction and contrast lost. Larger models can be bulky and heavy, and the eyepiece can sometimes be in awkward positions. Catadioptrics likewise have pluses and minuses. On the plus side, they reduce optical aberrations to minimal levels, provide good light gathering power, 
eyepieces are generally in very convenient locations and they offer excellent portability. On the downside though, cats are the most expensive per inch of aperture, have the greatest amount of light loss due to multiple lenses and mirrors, often have the largest central obstruction, tube currents due to sealed systems can cause poor images before fully cooled to outdoor temperatures. Okay, so let us now study the uh, so-called equatorial mount. So this reflecting telescope is mounted in what we call an equatorial mount. This is quite different from the altasimultal mount of uh, the refracting telescope, the one that I mentioned a while ago. So if you will notice, this uh, part of the mount must be pointed at the polar star. The polar star is Polaris. So we, we must look at the north. We must find first north using this uh, digital compass. So if we find north, then this uh, part of the equatorial mount should be pointed north. And uh, this part is tilted at about 15 degrees from the horizontal. In fact, the North Star or Polaris is 15 degrees above the horizon or 14.2 something degrees above the horizon. Okay, now you will notice that in the equatorial mount there are two knobs here. We have, this is what we call the declination knob and this is the right ascension knob. So, if your mount is polar aligned and if you were able to find your target, all you need to adjust is the right ascension knob. Okay, right ascension because if you will use your body, your front here is north, the back is south, your right hand here is east, and uh, the sun, the moon, and the planets, they all rise east, uh, eastward. So, right ascension. So, the moon and the planets, they ascend eastward. So, right ascension. So, if everything is polar aligned, then all you need to adjust is the right ascension knob. And this uh, mount is very good for astrophotography. And if you have a uh, a motor motorized uh, thing you can attach it here and it will all be automatic so that's the advantage of the equatorial mount uh, in contrast to the alta simultan mount okay all right so at this point let us now uh, tackle a very important uh, component of the telescope which is the eyepiece now, your telescope is as good as your eyepiece. Okay, the eyepiece can greatly improve the uh, capability of your telescope. Now, I have here um, my own eyepiece. Now, the uh, workhorse of amateur astronomy is this eyepiece called Plossil. Okay, Plossil. And uh, the eyepiece that I'm holding has uh, a focal length of about 15 mm. Okay, I have here 15 mm eyepiece, plosil eyepiece. Okay, all right. So I have here also uh, another eyepiece, plosil, but it has a focal length. Of 20 mm okay so 20 mm and 15 mm okay so oh, baka tanong yan ano mas maganda 15 or 20 mm well it depends so if you want uh, your image to be magnified then I suggest you use a 15 mm eyepiece Okay, meron pa mga eyepiece na lower than 15. Okay, may 10 mm, uh, you have 5 mm. So, as you lower the focal length of the eyepiece, 
you actually increase the magnification of the image. Okay? So, um, between 20 and 15 mm, uh, which eyepiece will give you a greater magnification? Oh, what do you think? Alright, so you got it. It's the 15 mm. Okay? But uh, the uh, disadvantage of using an eyepiece with a lower focal length is that it also uh, decreases the field of view. Okay? So, what is the field of view? So, when you see this, yan yung lens. So, pag sumilip tayo dun sa lens na yan, may circular area. Okay? And that circular area is your field of view. Alright? So, as you lower the focal length, let's say, the, to 10 mm, well, this is a 15 mm eyepiece, so 10, 5 mm, yes, you increase the magnification, but you also decrease the field of view. Right? And in amateur astronomy, ayaw natin yung maliit yung field of view. We want to have a much larger field of view. Makakitang kita. Malawak. Okay? Now, using this 20 mm eyepiece would do just that. Medyo malaki yung field of view neto but uh, of lesser magnification compared to 15 mm. So, depende. So, sir, ano bang gagamitin natin? 15 or 20? Depende sa gusto ninyo. So, if you want a wider field of view, kanya, sisilip kayo sa buwan, but you want to photograph the moon with a wide field of view, yun, eto. You can use the 20 mm eyepiece. Okay? Uh, if you want to photograph the moon with more detail, then I suggest you use a 15 mm eyepiece. Okay? Uh, this is uh, Plosil. This is the uh, workhorse of amateur astronomy. Ito yung madalas gamitin ng mga amateur astronomers. Okay, the Plosil eyepiece. Alright? Okay. Now, uh, an important accessory that amateur astronomers must have is this one. Alright, this is called a Barlow lens. Okay, so what is a Barlow lens? A Barlow lens is a tele-negative amplifier. So, ano ibig sabihin ito? Now, the lens here is a diverging lens. So, ano siya? Concave. Concave lens. So, what it does is it increases the uh, focal length of your telescope. So, if your focal length uh, is increased, then that is translated to a higher magnification. So, uh, what a Barlow lens does is it increases the magnification of your image. Though, ang ginagawa niya lang niya talaga is increasing the focal length of the telescope. Okay? So, you get your usual eyepiece, okay? And you insert the eyepiece onto the Barlow lens, like so. And you insert the Barlow lens with the eyepiece to the focuser of your telescope. Alright? Now, the Barlow lens is essential, especially in observing planets. Okay, like uh, if you want to observe Jupiter with the Galilean moons or the rings of Saturn, then I suggest you make use of the Barlow lens. Okay? So, the Barlow lens increases the focal length and that is translated to a higher magnification. Okay, so this is a, a very important accessory for amateur astronomers. The Barlow lens. Okay. Now, a special type of eyepiece which is optional for the amateur astronomer is a zoom eyepiece. 
Okay, so this eyepiece that I'm holding is called a zoom eyepiece. Now, if you will look closely at the numbers etched in the eyepiece, so you have the numbers 8 to 24 mm. Okay, so what does that mean? Now, a zoom eyepiece will allow you to change the uh, focal length of your eyepiece. So, between 8 to 24 mm. Okay, so what's the implication of that? So, by changing the focal length of your eyepiece, you can actually change the magnification of your telescope. Now, we know for a fact that uh, an eyepiece with a lower focal length is translated to a higher magnification. So, if your eyepiece has a focal length of 8 mm, that would give you a higher magnification compared to an eyepiece with a 24 mm focal length. Okay? Now, this zoom eyepiece will allow you to shift or to change the focal length. So, let's say uh, in this eyepiece, you are set to 24 mm. And if you want to increase the image, the magnification of the image, then you can just turn the eyepiece like so and shift to 8 mm by just turning the eyepiece. Okay? So, by shifting the uh, focal length from 24 to 8 mm, um, the magnification of your image would increase. See? So, that's what a zoom eyepiece does. So, what's the advantage of this? So, this means that you don't need to change eyepieces from time to time. Okay? So, let's say, gusto nyo palitan yung magnification. So, magpapalit pa kayo ng eyepiece, di ba? From a uh, 20 mm eyepiece, magpapalit kayo to 8 mm eyepiece. So, that's quite tedious. Mabusisi po. But if you have a zoom eyepiece, you can just turn the eyepiece like so. And you change the focal length from 24 to 8 or vice versa from 8 to 24. So, isa lang yung eyepiece ninyo but you can shift the focal length. So, para na rin kayong may mga eyepieces. Okay? So, nakatipid pa kayo. Right? So, that's the advantage of having a zoom eyepiece. And the uh, field of view of a zoom eyepiece is much larger. Like, uh, if you are in the 24 mm focal length, mas, ano siya, mas malaki yung field of view as compared to a regular plosil eyepiece with the same focal length. Alright? So, this is a zoom eyepiece. Anyway, this is just optional for the amateur astronomer. So, it's up to you if you want uh, one eyepiece. And you can change the focal length or you can have several eyepieces with different focal lengths. So that's up to the astronomer. Alright, anyway, this is the uh, zoom eyepiece. The first thing to know about eyepieces is that your telescope is only as good as the eyepieces that you use with it. Though you don't need to spend a lot of money to get decent views either. They come in three barrel diameters. Even if one of them is largely not manufactured anymore, the .965 inch ones, and the popular 1.25 inches and 2 inches. You can easily use adapters to fit smaller eyepieces into larger focusers, but it's a bit more difficult to go the other way, though .965 adapters for 1.25 inch eyepieces do exist. So why do we have different eyepieces and different barrel diameters for them? Well, in the prior video we learned about focal ratio. Shorter focal ratios allow telescopes to be shorter. What that also does though is make the angle of the light cone much steeper. So larger eyepieces are often needed, otherwise part of that light cone vignettes or gets cut off usually due to focuser tube diameters. Vignetting is not a good thing because it effectively reduces the aperture of your telescope. And the larger your aperture, the fainter objects you can see. No sense in reducing aperture unnecessarily. That would be dumb.
So the 0.965 inch eyepieces were used in long focal length telescopes because they would not vignette the shallow light cone. They could also be for simpler designs. Christian Huygens developed one of the first true eyepieces that used two lenses to focus the telescope's light, unlike Galileo who used a single lens. A simple design, the Huygens also has a narrow field of view, often just 35 or 40 degrees. These are often designated with an H on the top or side of the eyepiece. A similar two lens design is the Ramsden, usually signified by an R or SR on the eyepiece. Because of the simplistic two lens focusing setup, they are adequate for short focal lengths in long F-ratio telescopes. When made well and paired with longer focal length scopes, they can perform pretty well, but most current offerings are done inexpensively and unfortunately placed with short F-ratio telescopes, which means they often do not provide good views and therefore produce a lot of optical aberrations. A somewhat better design is the three-element Kellner eyepiece, offering a slightly wider apparent field of view of 45 degrees it also does a better job of correcting some of those optical aberrations of slightly faster telescope designs. It is usually designated by a K on the eyepieces. The Edmund Scientific Company took that design, flipped it upside down, and called it an RKE. Mead did something similar, terming it a modified acromat, or MA. Though simple in design and inexpensive to make, they do perform quite adequately in F8 instruments or longer, though the apparent field of view is somewhat restricted. But the real breakthrough is the four element Plossel, today's workhorse standard good eyepiece. With a 52 degrees apparent field of view and good optical correction for aberrations, even in somewhat faster telescopes, these are an eyepiece that can be used in most any telescope and it will work fairly well. They're not terribly expensive and in mid to longer focal lengths, they also offer good eye relief. Wait, eye what? Yeah, eye relief. That is the distance you can place your eye away from the lens and see the full field of view in the eyepiece. And the problem with all of the eyepieces above is that the shorter focal length, the shorter the eye relief is until you get situations like this. <laughs> and if you wear glasses, this can be even more problematic. More exotic types of eyepieces have therefore been developed with five, six, and sometimes nine or more lenses, occasionally making for very heavy and large eyepieces as well, that can be used in very fast telescopes, have good eye relief, and with enormous apparent fields of view, but correspondingly, they also cost quite a bit more too. One thing to look for in lesser eyepieces is to be sure that all of the lens elements are coated with anti-reflection coatings, at minimum a layer of coatings and ideally every lens surface will be multi-coated. Expensive eyepieces will have the standard, the lower cost the eyepiece, the less likely all lens elements and all sides of all lenses will have those coatings. Now aside from the refracting and the reflecting telescopes, uh, there are other types of telescopes used by the astronomer. And one such telescope is called a radio telescope. Now, a radio telescope focuses the uh, incoming radio waves on an antenna, okay, which, just like a radio antenna, absorbs and transmits these waves to an amplifier. So basically what a radio telescope does is it collects radio waves from deep space okay? as compared to the refracting and the reflecting telescopes that collects light a radio telescope collects radio waves okay using this huge antenna all right so here is a diagram on how a radio telescope works so a radio telescope is uh, composed of a huge dish antenna, parang ano, parang satellite dish, okay? Pero ito malaki, okay? And uh, this huge dish antenna, they collect radio waves from 
deep space. Okay? Then the weak radio signals are then uh, received by an amplifier. Then the amplified radio signals are then uh, brought to a computer for analysis. Okay? So instead of collecting light, a radio telescope collects radio waves. Okay? All right, and uh, this radio telescope is the second largest radio telescope in the world. This is the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. This is used by SETI in the search for extraterrestrial life. SETI is the acronym for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Okay, second lang yan. The largest radio telescope is in China. Okay? Alright. So, in this case, you have several dish uh, antenna that uh, receives signals para malawak yung, yung range ng radio telescope. Okay? So, you have an array of radio antennae that can receive and collect signals from deep space. Okay? Alright, so radio telescopes are much less affected by turbulence in the atmosphere, clouds, and weather. Unlike the uh, refracting and the reflecting telescopes, okay, uh, using those telescopes, so we are at the mercy of the weather. So, pag maulap, wala na. Diba? Pag umuulan, wala na rin. You can't use the uh, refracting or the reflecting telescope. So... Uh, you know, in amateur astronomy, we are at the mercy of the weather. Pero itong radio telescopes, no. So, they are not affected by turbulence in the atmosphere, clouds, and the weather. So, radio telescopes can see through interstellar dust clouds that obscure visible wavelengths. So, kaya nilang ipenetrate yan. Okay? All right. Now, another type of telescope is what we call the space telescopes. Space telescopes orbit above the Earth's atmosphere, okay, and thus produce clearer images as compared to Earth-based telescopes. So, they are not affected by the weather kasi nasa taas na sila ng Earth's atmosphere. They orbit the, the Earth. Okay, and the first space telescope is the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, built by NASA, the Hubble Space Telescope was, was put into orbit uh, in April of 1990. Okay, so ito yung Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, uh, other space telescopes would include the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and we also have the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and in 2011, um, NASA plans to launch the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay? And that's a James Webb Telescope. This is the Chandra X-ray Telescope. And the uh, Kepler Space Telescope. I'm sure you're familiar with the Kepler Space Telescope. Uh, the main objective of the Kepler Space Telescope is to search for exoplanets. And... That's what the Kepler telescope did. The Kepler telescope had discovered thousands of these exoplanets. Okay, so we are now uh, beginning the search for planets outside our solar system and the possibility of life in one of those exoplanets. All right. Okay, so those are the different types of telescopes use in astronomy. Okay, well, I hope you have learned uh, much about our discussion today about the telescope. Okay, so again, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. And please don't forget to check out our Facebook page, the Bedan Society of Young Astronomers. Okay, ito, dito yan, Bedan Society of Young Astronomers. Okay, and we will have more of this virtual 
astronomy lectures in the near future. Okay, so in behalf of the officers and crew of BSYA, and also in behalf of the uh, administrators of San Beda University Senior High School, this is Professor June Cahigal saying, Live long and prosper, and I'll see you next time. Virtually, that is. Stay safe, everybody. There. There she is. NASA's Voyager 1. Launched in 1977. But uh, that, that's just uh, very small potatoes compared to uh, what the Earth is involved with and is about. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone.